friends, Uncle Marv here with part two of my chat with a 365 guru starting Diana Giles with Skyline IT Management. Diana, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm <laughs> good. I'm good. So this is, I don't know, three part, four part, five part series on um, Microsoft 365 and what we as IT providers should kind of know and think about when moving our customers to the cloud, whether we are starting fresh or doing a little hybrid migration. So, uh, so last, Diana, we talked about just simply understanding what the differences in the licenses were, what some of the benefits were. And we talked all about, you know, the foundation of understanding. Now we're going to talk about the foundation of getting started in terms of setting stuff up. But let's quickly go back. Uh, we talked about the licenses. We talked about, you know, this additional security and things of that nature. Is there anything else that we should know before we actually start the journey of setting our clients up? Uh yeah. Yes, I'm going to kind of just go over, uh, we, we talked about it in the first uh, segment, but didn't really give the visuals. So since I'm going to be sharing my screen anyway, I thought uh, I'll kind of give people a visual representation of the differences between business standard and, and business premium. You know, this is, you know, the series that we're doing, you know, there's going to be a lot of IT providers that are already very heavy in the Microsoft 365 space. but what I'm hoping is that this may encourage some people who uh, have been just thinking about it and, and haven't really uh, wanted to move their clients to the cloud yet, maybe, uh, that this might be a, you know, a catalyst to help them kind of look into that and take it, uh, you know, take it seriously, like maybe something they want to do. All right, well, this is why I asked uh, for you to help me with this, because I'm one of those people that, yeah, <laughs> I've dabbled in 365. I've done some stuff here, but taking somebody all the way is what I have not done yet. Maybe it's time to do so. So where do you want to start? Okay. Well, uh, I guess let's start with me sharing my screen. Okay. Try to get that accomplished here. <laughs> all right. And for uh, those who are, maybe you missed the first one and you started with number two, uh, Diana, as I mentioned earlier, Skyline IT Management uh, has really become, I, I mean, I call her guru, but uh, <laughs> is somebody that in our community uh, is embracing the 365 movement and uh, can help a lot of us here. So here we are. Uh, there is our screen. Okay. Got, oh, got goodness, in there. Like a freaking... Uh, <laughs> What is that game show? The outtake Azure AD free for 200 hours. <laughs> yes, it, it does look like Jeopardy there a little bit. But uh, this is just a, a website called m365maps.com. And it's I just love this graphic that they have or these graphics that they have because they really do kind of give you a good representation of the differences between all of the various licensing. They These are just a couple of them. But uh, Microsoft... 365 business standard, this is what is included in that. And, and you know, we're all in this tech community very familiar with most of these, I'm sure. But um, this is the difference in Microsoft 365 business premium. So what we were looking at is, you know, a lot of these things that are under this 365 in the red section. But your, then now, your traditional Office 365. Mm -hmm, right. But then there's even some different, there's some add-on things here too, uh, just a few that are different. But then all of the uh, the kind of teal section, I guess, for the um, device management in tune. I'm so glad they went back to calling it in tune. Uh, information protection, and then everything that you get with Azure AD Premium One, which is that's where so much of the security controls and kind of those things that you would think about the traditional server kind of controlling, uh, and then the Intune would take the place of like configuration manager and those things that you also would do with server. But uh, that's what I mean by you know how it you know the Azure Cloud Azure AD 
cloud with business premium really does take the place of that. And then, you know, you do get the pro license. I mean, most of the, I don't know that that's something that's necessarily, um, you know, going to be something that everyone is going to say, wow, you know, because they're typically going to be on a, a business version of Windows anyway, but it is, it is something that you do get with that. And then Defender for Business was something that when Business Premium originally came out, that was actually not part of it. And then Microsoft came up with Business, uh, with Defender, you know, and they actually rolled that into Business Premium 1. So, I still use a third party um, security, you know, uh, EDR and that type of thing. But essentially, and I have heard very good um, reviews uh, about what you, you know, how Defender for Business is working uh, for everyone. And it is very, very uh, all encompassing as far as a security uh, platform. So that is also included in the business premium. I just, I haven't uh, made that switch yet, but it's something that I'm considering. So I see there, I mean, web content filtering, that literally is a part of the Defender for Business? Mm -hmm. Yeah, All right. you get uh, yeah. advanced, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of advanced uh, security tools. And I mean, and it really is a very in-depth platform just in itself. Just right. So is this all part of the 365 dashboard? I mean, is there a separate dashboard for things like content filtering and the... Um, well, in this, yeah, it's going to be on the security and then you have to actually, you know, go in and activate the Windows Defender, um, you know, part of it, the module okay. that, um, but now, whereas before it was something that you kind of had to add on. Well, now it is actually part of I mean, it's available to you if you have business premium. All right. So m365maps.com. I'll have a yep. link in the show notes that you can go and see the pretty graph. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is just the, uh, the main kind of admin center. Um, some of the things that I just kind of wanted to, to touch on are just kind of how to get started because it is, you know, a really, uh, it's like one of my instructors said, it's a mile wide and an inch deep. Uh, and, you know, it really is. There's just so much there. It can be a little overwhelming. I will say that Microsoft does give somebody the ability to kind of do an out-of-the-box setup, a guided setup, and, you know, they have security defaults and a lot of things that you can turn on just you could still have a secure environment that would be better than just if you didn't do that. Um, but I like to customize it. There's a lot of advantages, I think, to that. Sometimes if you do their uh, defaults, you can end up with some pretty heavy restrictions that can kind of get in the way of the users and, and that kind of thing. So I typically don't do the security defaults and do a lot of the setup you know, more of a, from a customized perspective, but I just wanted everyone to know that that is something that is there as an option if, if you wanted to. Um, the things that, besides like we talked about in the last uh, episode, I guess you'd say, you know, uh, kind of really analyzing your client's data and just seeing what are the needs there, who needs access and trying to evaluate where things might be best stored. There are some other things that when you're you're getting started either from scratch or doing a migration, uh, users and getting those user accounts set up is, is definitely going to be really important. If you're bringing somebody over from a server, you're going to have to uh, get those accounts really cleaned up and uh, that's going to make for a much smoother process when you sync over. So that's, you know, definitely something you want to consider the so, hang on hang on uh -huh. you say got to get those accounts cleaned up what exactly does that mean well you um there there's information that microsoft puts out as far as like you want to make sure that the um you know the users have this type of format as far as their names naming convention you know because you're going to be bringing that over to the user principal name is what it becomes in microsoft 365 and so you just want to uh, take into account formatting, uh, you know, any kind of issues with particular uh, groups and, and things that you've had on the server side that maybe you don't want to carry forward. And there's a lot of documentation from Microsoft about just how to go through and get those, 
you know, get your server users and groups set up properly to make the transition smoother. Okay. Uh, then if, if you're going to be starting up, you know, from scratch, or if you're going to be doing like a migration coming from Google Workspace or that kind of thing, it it's um, more of, you know, you're going to want to make sure that when you get your users, uh, you're, you're going to be importing those basically. So you don't have to necessarily set them up. Uh, they do have an import feature. If you just were going to want to bring them in through an Excel spreadsheet, you can do that, you know, a CSV, you can do that. Uh, but essentially one of the very first things you're going to want to do is either set up your users or uh, get ready for them to come in through the migration. So that's kind of, you know, a basic thing. But one thing that people don't often think about is the licensing. You want to make sure that the licenses are there already, because when you have the users, it's better, it's more efficient if you set the, assign the licenses at that time. And if they're not available, then you can't do that. So it's, it's just, it, it ends up taking more time if you don't do it that way. Um, one thing with, uh, getting like kind of ready to do some of the other setup that I think is really important is getting your groups going. And uh, you can set up groups here in the regular admin center, but I typically do it in Azure AD, which is going to be, you know, Azure Active Directory, which is here. Uh, then groups, you know, we're all kind of used to groups, but one thing that you that I would encourage people to use in Microsoft 365 is dynamic groups. And the benefits of dynamic groups, um, you know how when someone leaves the company, you have to go and manually take them out, you know, otherwise. So dynamic groups allows you to um, remove them from every where they are when you, you know, take care of that user account when that person leaves, it's going to automatically remove them from these other, other um, groups and, and access that they've had. So the, the dynamic group is, you can still do assigned if you want to, uh, and for various things that might be, you know, appropriate. But um, we'll just like, I'm just going to go in here to this Windows device group. Now this would be something that you'd be using if you're doing Intune because you're going to manage the Windows devices. So there's user groups and devices groups. This one is a, de a, a device group. But the, uh, the thing that I'm talking about here is the dynamic membership rules. And you can get pretty granular here. And it can be a little uh, complex. There's a, a great, if you, you know, click here on the learn more, you can go to the page to actually see how these um, what these words need to be like so that you would know that it has to be company you know what is the word that is going to decide if something is owned by the company so um, that learning page comes in very handy for that kind of thing but uh, you can control a lot of different things even down to like models um, of devices and, and things like that um, it can be it can get very granular Important thing here, I think, to know when you're using these or something that can come in handy is this validation. If you go in here, then you can actually see after you've created these rules, if it's going to apply to the people you think it is or to the devices you think it is. So you could add various devices and then validate and it'll it'll either come up with a green check mark or a red X basically that says, nope, that didn't get those people. So sometimes you, it makes you realize you have to go back and uh, reconfigure your rules or, you know, uh, change a value or something like that. But dynamic membership um, in groups really does, uh, I think, save a lot of time and and it just makes uh, makes it more automatic, right? We're all about automation now. So right. I really like those when, when I can do it. So this goes beyond <laughs> what we traditionally know in Active Directory as organizational units. Yes. And yes. group policy. So this exactly. basically dynamic groups is kind of what? Both of those combined? Yes. I mean, you, um, it gives you, I mean, they're, they're different, obviously. But uh, the other thing that I guess I should have mentioned here is the, the different, besides 
uh, dynamic and uh, assigned, which is how the groups get formed, there's also the types of groups. So Microsoft 365 groups are going to be different than a security group. So a Microsoft 365 group is going to allow you to say, you know, that automatically pretty much creates a team and uh, that is going to create like a, a SharePoint resource and, and those kind of things. So if you uh, think about the Microsoft 365 groups, those can be assigned or dynamic, right? So it's a group type and then it's also how the groups get put together and the, the assigning or dynamic is how they get put together. Okay. Uh, security group is gonna be something that's more, you know, for the IT, uh, people and how you manage either users or devices, and then 365 groups, which I would encourage you to use 365 groups over security groups, and you know unless there's particular reasons in certain circumstances. But 365 groups are kind of um, that's Microsoft's new way to manage how the users inter interact with the apps and, and that kind of thing. Okay. So, uh, so that's one thing I definitely wanted to mention is, you know, use dynamic groups uh, when you're putting your groups together. And when you are starting your tenant setup, you want to do users and groups really at the beginning. So after the, you know, the groups would, would come into play maybe after a migration, but you're going to want to do your groups before you kind of start doing all the other things that you want to do in setting up your tenant, uh, especially when it comes to Intune and that kind of thing, because otherwise you'll get into it and you'll be needing to assign a group to something and you can't because you don't have a group yet. So that that's a tip there. Uh, the other thing, you know, we've talked about, and it probably can't be said enough, that really one of the main benefits of uh, Microsoft Business Premium or 365 Business Premium is the security aspect of it. And one of the pieces of that security that is really so critical and that really does set a business standard tenant apart is conditional access policies. And so um, that is what allows you to control who has access to a device or to a data set and uh, you know various criteria numerous criteria that you can choose um, to decide how that access is granted or not granted and so i wanted to touch on those because you know they're really they're very important to having a secure 365 environment but they're also you know really useful um, one thing that I was, this is just a tip on how I like to do it. Everybody's going to have a different thing um, or a different way that they like to do it. But this kind of goes first, the first thing I'm going to say goes overall. Um, naming conventions, we've all, you know, for years and years, you know, it's, it's really critical. I think with 365, you just want to make sure that you're um, very detailed. You may think um, typing a short, you know, an abbreviated, uh, word or something like that and, and maybe not doing it as detailed will work because you'll remember but then maybe you don't so <laughs> I I always just try to make it you know as detailed as possible because you end up thanking yourself later so I would say you know use and, and across your client base try to use similar naming conventions um, just makes it easier I think but uh, another thing is I like for conditional access policies to state in the policy, whether it is a grant or a block policy that can help when you're doing some troubleshooting on, you know, maybe why a printer isn't working or, or something like that. So um, what, we'll just kind of get into some of these so you can kind of see what the various uh, uh, settings are that you change for conditional access. So first of all, it's the, you know, what users are going to be involved. Typically what you're going to do is at least, um, you know, in a lot of things that would, that could possibly keep somebody from being able to log into the tenant, uh, is you're going to exclude your, um, now this one, it doesn't matter because this is for users, not admins, but you're going to ex exclude your admins on some of these policies, not, not your admin, but your break glass admin. So it might apply to your admins, it should apply to your admins, but you're gonna have maybe an account that it might not apply to, that you just have other forms of you know, uh, 
extensive security on that account, such as, you know, a hundred letter password or whatever. Um, so that's a good, because you don't want to lock yourself out of your tenant. That would be bad. So you do want to always create a break glass account. I should have probably mentioned that. Um, you create a, you know, a global admin account that can do everything. And then you also have a break glass global admin account because really uh, getting locked out or some sort of glitch happening on that other account and you not being able to get in um, is, would be devastating, I would think. So um, your distributor can possibly help in that situation, but um, Microsoft, I don't think will. So the- uh, For those of us yeah. that are reselling either through, you know, AppRiver, Zix or SureWeb, those would be, they have their own backdoor tenant access yes. that can help in an emergency. Yes, yeah. Uh, okay, so, you know, you have to control what, you know, which users is this policy going to apply to? Which apps is it going to apply to? Um, you can get specific or you can just say all cloud apps. Um, the conditions, in this case, it's going to be, uh, we're looking here at the, you know, browser and mobile apps. So these are going to be, you know, if somebody is going to be given access to these things, they have to provide multi-factor authentication. This is, um, you know, one of, this is probably the most basic conditional access policy you're going to have, but everybody should have it. And then this one is a grant policy. So you can see um, all of the various options here. And a lot of these are kind of um, new, like this require authentication strength. This um, is something where you can, you can say, okay, it's not just going to be regular multi-factor authentication. It's going to be you know, the uh, phishing resistant type or, or that kind of thing. And this is this is a, a really new addition. So uh, we're gonna say that if they require, that they are required with one of these controls, and that is to uh, have multi-factor authentication. And if they have that, then they will be granted access. So um, these policies are really, when you first start using them, they can be a little, you know, confusing and um, whether it's a block or a grant or after you start using them a while, you know, it, it becomes a lot easier. But uh, some of the basic ones you're going to want is MFA and then blocking legacy authentication is certainly another one. So that would be, you know, unless a particular oh. app has the ability to do multi-factor authentication, um, it's not even going to have access to Microsoft 365. Allow and disallow locations. You set that up under named locations here. So first you have to create what are your allowed and disallowed. In this case, we just it's just um, USA or everything else. And then you can determine in your policy to block anybody trying to log in from another location. And we all know that this can get, you know, and then bad guys can get around those kind of things, but the idea is just to make it as difficult as possible and put up as many roadblocks as possible. Uh, so anyway, there's a lot. We could do a whole session or more on just conditional access policies, but they are very key to keeping your Microsoft tenant secure. So I wanted to at least touch on those there. Uh, oh, and then just so you know, a couple of things. Um, you can do templates now for these. And so instead of having to manually set them up, you can go in here and then it doesn't turn it on, but it allows, it sets it up and then you can go in and activate it when you're ready. Um, I would, right. oh yeah, go ahead. I say templates for secure foundation, zero trust, remote work. Yes, and it kind of narrows them down to the different categories, yeah. So like no persistent browser session, that's really good for an admin, especially you, um, you know, so that, if your session token, there's other, there's some new things on that, that are coming out to prevent session token stealing, uh, which, you know, would allow the uh, bad guy to get your session token and log in as you, but, but keeping your browser session, closing that browser session and forcing an admin to log in again is, is another way. So I always use that. Um, let's see, I went back. Now, this would be something that, you know, a lot of people are 
still now getting the emails from Microsoft saying, we are going to turn on security defaults for your organization. And I know a lot of people actually go in and turn those off so that their users, because listen, people are lazy and don't want to do multi-factor, but if you're going to turn it off, this would be one of those exceptions where you say, well, the reason I'm turning it off is because we're using conditional access. Right. Which is yeah. to turn it back on. For I always turn it. That's one of the first things I do is turn off security defaults because I'm using conditional access. It's right. kind of an either or. Um, and one thing I also want to mention that's good with the conditional access is this what if. This can help you when you're setting up new policies. Um, maybe you, you've had an idea of a policy. Hey, I want to and try this. You can actually pin in a scenario and find out if that policy would work or if it would block or, you know, um, you, that way you kind of troubleshoot ahead of time uh, a scenario and make sure you don't lock all your, um, you know, C-suite people out or something. But, okay. So all that right. what if is nice. Uh, okay. So another kind of foundation thing I always, um, I, because this to me is one of the the really um, other nice features as far as security goes that you get with 365 that you don't get with standard um, is the more detailed phishing policies. This is under the security tab. Basically you would go from here, from the main admin, um, but you get into the policies that govern your um, the threats and with standard, you get some phishing, but not as extensive as you do here, but you certainly do not get the safe attachments and the safe links. And these really are, they're part of the um, 365 advanced threat protection. So they are going to give your uh, email, your client's email, a substantial uh, leg up on security because uh, you know they won't be able to execute, uh, you know, a particular attachment or a link without it getting filtered. So this is really a huge part of 365, I think. So that's one of the first things that I set up are these threat policies. And I haven't on this demo tenant yet, but uh, it's uh, it's definitely one of the things that I, one of the first things that I do. Now this is Again, something where your users need to have the premium license for this to propagate out, correct? Yes. If you were to go into, if this was a standard tenant, you would see anti-phishing, anti-spam, and anti-malware. But the phishing options would be very uh, much, there would be, it'd be limited compared to what you would get here. Okay. It's, um, it's not nearly as detailed as the one here. Um, but you would not see safe attachments or safe links. That would not be in a standard. Okay. So uh, those are, you know, those are a lot of the, I mean, it's not like that's the only thing you need to do when you set up a tenant. Obviously there's a lot more, um, you know, if you're, if you're going to start doing this for your clients and moving them, I would say it's definitely something you want to put into your documentation and have checklists because it's, it's not something that you can do without a checklist, really. You just, I mean, uh, I have checklists to, uh, quite a lengthy checklist, actually, to go through and, you know, get everything done that, that needs to be done. But these are certainly the, the kind of the highlights, the, the foundational things I would say you want to do at the very beginning and uh, then go from there. All right. Let me throw in an oddball question mm -hmm. because I remember maybe it was a year ago at some point that somebody said that you don't have to have all of your users on premium. You just need to have one user on premium and Microsoft has allowed it to leak where these settings could be deployed out to standard users. Have they tightened that up yet or my understanding is in some cases, some of those things will um, work, um, but you won't be in compliance with licensing. Okay. So each user needs to have, now 
there can be, um, let's say you have first line workers and, you know, all they need is access on a tablet. You know, they don't need, they just need a first line worker license. It's not like every single one of those, you know, staff members needs to have a business premium. I mean, there are licensing for those type of situations for that reason. But if you're going to have somebody who's got, you know, a desktop or laptop, you know, and a phone and, and all of that, they're going to need to have a full license. And the reason I thought of that, looking at all of this and thinking this would be a great motivator to clients say, look, all of your, all of your users need to have this, but some of them are going to come back and say, you know what, we've got a receptionist that doesn't do anything except answer calls and forward calls and take messages. So we just want to have a standard license <laughs> for our where that this may or may not work for them. Right, right. Well, and it kind of depends on the um, that office environment. You know, sometimes um, the user can go with the workstation. So, you know, you may have a receptionist area. They may have a couple of devices there, but multiple people. And so, you know, it's really one position. So right. a lot of times that's what I do in those kind of because you want their email to be secure and you want the device to be able to be managed and deployed and, and get the benefits that you have from autopilot and all of that. Um, but if you just have a, a first line worker, you know, with a tablet that, you know, there are licensing um, licenses for that kind of situation, certainly. And you can, you can play around with the licensing until you get it. Um, I mean, if it doesn't, you can always try it. And if it doesn't work, you know, um, then you add more. <laughs> all right. And again, this is all the stuff that you try to set up before you start setting up users or importing them. Now, in a situation well, where- Yeah, and some of this is. I mean, now I will set up the conditional access policies ahead of time. I just leave them off because some of those would interfere with the migration and that kind of thing. But um, these are some things that you can certainly do ahead of time. You just don't assign them. Maybe you don't, or you don't turn them on. If you have, let's say you could, you could set up all of your, you know, Intune policies and configurations. You just maybe don't assign them to anybody yet, or, you know, that kind of thing. You can always yeah. activate things later. So what happens with a tenant? Let's say we've got a tenant that, you know, they've been in 365 for years, but using it just for email. And we want to start doing these things. Um, do you do all of this before you change their licenses? No, because the license, if you didn't change the license, some of these things wouldn't be available. Okay. Yeah. So you need to change the licenses first. Right. You assign the licenses to the users when you're, you know, setting them up, bringing them in, you, you know, it's whatever's applicable to your situation. Okay. Wow, that was a lot there. <laughs> it's a lot, but it's it's good. I mean, it, it really is. Uh, I think it's it's one of those things that sometimes you don't really get the benefits, and maybe even your clients won't get the benefits yet until they experience it. You know, because um, I mean, there's just so many things that you can do to really customize it and. And even those customizations not only make it aesthetically pleasing for your client, but they're also really a part of security. And um, so, you know, those are some things we can go into. I don't know if we have time on this one, um, but that might be another segment. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we take another break and give ourselves a few minutes and we'll come back and do another segment and move on to part three of our chats with a 365 guru. Sound good? That, is, that sounds good. <laughs> okay. All right, <laughs> folks. Um, obviously, you'll see the video end, and we'll have separate show notes uh, for this. And if you're just listening by audio, I'm going to encourage you. There will be a link on the website to go to the video that you can follow along. Obviously, this was a screen share that you, you actually want to see it while you're going through it. So yes. I encourage you to do that. And uh, we'll be back here pretty soon with Dinah Giles, Skyline IT Management. Uh, we'll see you in a bit. Hey.